Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, my sister's all over me. I was having a nice relaxing time thinking about time for us to no longer do videos. I've had a mailbox full of my sisters knowing like, what is going on with this new variant? All of her friends are calling, so we're gonna talk about the new variant. But first, let's talk about what's going on. You know, you'll notice for the, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've always spent time talking about what's going on in the world. And the reason we've had to do that is because we'll never be free of variants unless the entire world is low in viral replication. And so it was, in, it was just a matter of time. So I've been showing these maps of the world for a long time, showing that you know Europe's been very hot lately and that there could easily be variants that emerge from there. And also that South Africa and Botswana have been hot. So not surprising that there are variants coming out of that uh, from, from that part of the world. Uh, in the U.S., we're doing okay, not great. Uh, we've stabilized, I think we're on a, a plateau. Uh, this has been predicted by IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, for a long time. We'll likely see a very steady number of cases slightly rising in the winter, maybe falling towards the spring, unless the new variant makes it worse. Uh, we are still below 60% vaccination rate. I mean, this is ridiculous. We could, if we just got everybody vaccinated, we wouldn't have these problems, but people continue to be reluctant to get vaccinated. And we're up to almost 800,000 deaths, 778,000 deaths. Uh, the data hold firm on the, the uh, benefits of vaccination. It's six times less likely to be infected if you're vaccinated and 13 times less likely to die of the disease if you're vaccinated. So if you ever needed an excuse to get vaccinated or a reason to get vaccinated, that, that's it. Uh, if you look at hot spots in the country, our part of the country is doing pretty well. Not for necessarily the right reasons. We're doing pretty well because we had low vaccination rates and we had so many people infected. So, you know, on the other hand, we are doing better. Texas is looking pretty good right now. We're almost to levels that are low enough that um, soon we would be, unless the variant takes over, well, we'll be down to almost lower levels, you know, below 15 or 20 cases per 100,000. And our friends in Dimmick County, they're doing okay. They're, they're at moderate risk, but they're still, they're doing better. So congratulations, Dimmick County. Uh, here in the Texas Medical Center, we've been pretty stable. We've been averaging the last seven days about 515 cases a day. As you can see, it's not going down. It's just that same plateau we've been talking about. And the same for hospitalizations. Last week we averaged 63 hospitalizations per day. You can see it's just staying the same. So let's talk about South Africa. South Africa in the news for the wrong reasons. So a huge spike in South Africa over the last several days. And it's because the South African Health Department identified a new variant called Omicron. Now, I originally thought when they said it was Omicron that that was a, one of the Jupiter moons, but it turns out they skipped over two of the other Greek letters. So there was not going to be new because we don't want to say it's a new variant. That'd be very confusing. And we couldn't call it Xi variant because of Xi Jinping. We don't want to confuse it with the Chinese. So we came up with Omicron. Now, the only thing I can figure out is if everything else is two syllables, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, Omicron's got to be bad. It's three syllables. But that's the only evidence we have that it's bad so far. It is spread, uh, it was identified in South Africa by the South African uh, Health Department, and it is now spread to over 27 countries, including the United States. A traveler from South Africa was positive for Omicron. They hit, we were symptomatic, although mildly symptomatic. Uh, and I think the, you know, right now the world is panicking a bit. Uh, many countries have restricted travel from South Africa and Botswana. Uh, Japan, Israel, and Morocco are barring all foreign travelers, and Morocco has gone so far as to say, uh, all foreign travelers and domestic travelers who come from out of, out of the country are not no longer welcome in Morocco. And Australia is uh, delayed opening its borders for two weeks. And, you know, it's got everyone concerned. In the United States, uh, Britain, Canada, and the European Union have all restricted travel from South Africa, which, uh, you know, the South Africans are saying, well, we identified it. Why, why are you blaming us? Well, you know, that's there. And I think it's a reasonable thing, at least until we know what's going on, uh, to start uh, at least restricting tra travel uh, for a while. Well, I think the odds are it's not going to be that effective because it's already spread throughout the, you know, it's, it's probably all over the world. And my favorite, though, is uh, Governor Hochul declared a state of emergency because she said 
It's coming. It was a Paul Revere quote. It's coming, it's coming. And it's probably true. It's probably likely coming, and it may well already be there. So let's talk about Omicron itself. Really fascinating, and it's a different thing. This is the first time we've seen this. This is a top view looking down on spike protein. There are over 50 mutations, and 30 of them are in the spike protein. And if you look from the side, there are additional you know, 20 mutations. There are many of the same old friends that we've had before. There are the mutations that, in other variants that enhance binding, uh, binding affinity, that uh, enhance fusion to the cell membrane, that increase replication, and uh, some that probably evade the immune system, including the famous EEC mutation. It has all of those, plus a bunch of others. And so that's what's scaring everybody. But I, I mean, it's weird. You know, if you think about viral evolution, the virus is responding to the host. We are generating an immune response and, and changing what happens in our bodies with this virus. So if you look at the, what happens, is a person gets infected and has an increase in viral load. And they peak, and you become symptomatic. And as we've talked about many times with the pandemic, you're most likely to transmit virus at the peak of the virus right before you become symptomatic. Because when you become symptomatic, you are beginning to start your immune response and you generate an immune response that slowly but surely gets rid of the virus. And so the virus is under that selective pressure. So it has time to make one mutation or two mutations before it's transmitted to another person. And that's why we've seen over the last almost two years, these you know, various mutations, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, all have like one or two mutations. How do you get 50 mutations in a single one? So I think that what it, it's really fascinating because this is different. To get 50, it means that it must be in an individual or an individual group for a longer period of time, not the short three to four days and then transmitted. It must be sitting there replicating and replicating and replicating. The vast majority of the mutations are probably not even functional. But it got to a point where it did find a one or two of those mutations that are probably going to increase transmission. And so, you know, why would that be? Why would there, you know, what, what, what is a situation where the virus would stay in people longer for a longer period of time? Uh, and, you know, you would bet in a country that's not vaccinated, so there's, they're basically susceptible to the virus, and, and people who have host immune response problems. So we always talk about people with deficient immunity might have the virus last longer and replicate in them more. So that's a real issue. So let's talk, talk about vaccination first. Africa is the, is the continent with the lowest amount of vaccination. We've talked about this. It's not right. It's, it's based on economics. It's also based on the vaccine itself. You know, the, the mRNA vaccines require uh, ultra cold storage. They're not easy to give. That's why we've been talking about other forms of vaccines that need to go to the developing world and other countries where it's harder to provide the vaccines. Uh, if you look at the actual percentage of vaccines, you know, in, in Africa, look at that. I mean, they're, it's really low. It's like less than 28% of the entire population has received just one dose in all of South Africa. Africa is a continent, it's 11%. Whereas you look at Europe, you know, we're achieving 80%. The U.S. is around 60% with two doses, 69, 70% with one dose. So, we're, you know, the, the, the disparity is huge. But that means variants are going to form in places that are where there is low vaccination. And if you look at the outbreaks that are recently in South Africa, there have been three major regions, regions uh, Guantang, KwaZulu-Natal, and also the Western Cape. And those areas, have, you can see, particularly Guantang, had a giant spike in the summer. And this is the spike we're seeing now. Uh, in Guatang. And Guatang is the smallest of South Africa's nine prov provinces. And the three main cities are Johannesburg, so we, uh, Soweto, and uh, Shwani. And, and those, you know, high population number, high density, uh, and very low vaccination uh, rates. There, there's been some suggestion by the South African physicians that it's less uh, virulent, that doesn't cause as bad disease, because they've seen it mainly in younger people in the Guatang province and mostly mild symptoms. But if you look at the hospitalization rate, it's been going up. So I don't think we have any evidence that it's less virulent. My guess is it'll be about the same. But we talked about it, low vaccination rate. OK, that's one thing. But wh what's the reason for a host maybe harboring the virus a longer period of time? Well, there happens to be another global pandemic going on. It's called HIV. Uh, and if you look at where are the most cases of HIV, 
it's in the same region in South Africa. In fact, uh, KwaZulu-Natal has the highest prevalence, about 15.5% of the population is HIV positive. And, you know, the South African government has done a very, very good job of, of, of dealing with the HIV pandemic. 92% uh, of the citizens are aware of their status. 75% of the HIV patients who are positive are on treatment. And of those, 90% are suppressed. In other words, their virus is very low, and so they're immune competent. But that's, if you add all those numbers, that leaves about 30% of the total HIV population there not very well controlled. And there's a large immunocompromised patient population in a hot spot, low vaccination rate, and I'm not surprised that you're seeing a virus that evolves with multiple, multiple mutations because it stays in the host longer. This is all speculation. There's no evidence for this, but I have a feeling when they do the forensic analysis of the genet genetics, there will be a connection between what's going on with the HIV pandemic and COVID. We don't know that now. We won't know it for a long time, but you know, it's hard to figure out why you would suddenly have a, a, a mutation of 50 different mutants in the same virion. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense unless it stayed in the host for a longer period of time. So we need a few weeks. I mean, the bottom line is to my sister, Janet, I'm sorry. It's going to take a couple of weeks for me to answer all of the questions. You know, what, what scientists are doing now is taking each one of those 50 mutations and studying to see whether or not it has an impact on the, the ability of the virus to bind to, enter cells, or replicate. And they'll go through all 50 of them and they'll figure it out. Uh, the other way is to do a prevalence uh, analysis, look at what happens in our own community in terms of the viruses that are becoming predominant, and that's through a surveillance program. And if you look at, this is how we really find out which virus is more infectious, because it displaces the other viruses. So you can see initially in our country, we were infected with alpha virus, and it, it became the 100% of the viruses isolated. Gamma came along, did not really outcompete alpha, but Delta did, and Delta became the dominant uh, virus strain in the United States and got one up to 100%. If we see the emergence of the, of the Omicron strain begin to displace Delta, then we'll have evidence for increased virulence on a population level. Uh, and that's the only way we'll really be able to figure it out. We'll get some evidence in vitro in, in laboratories saying, oh yeah, it binds tighter, it's more infectious. But we really won't know until we see whether or not uh, it outcompetes Delta, and that's why we need a few weeks. So uh, what do we do in the meantime? I think the one thing is remember, this is a variant of concern, not VOC, not a VOP, not a variant to panic, a variant of panic. Uh, we don't know much about it yet. I think there's every reason to believe that the vaccines are probably uh, you know, still pretty effective, uh, even if it's not perfect. My guess is they will still uh, recognize the spike protein of Omicron, but we'll see. Uh, and so the answer to every single question is always vaccination. <laughs> you know, say, so what do I do? Get vaccinated. What do I do? Get a booster. If 90% of our population was vaccinated and was well protected, this would not even be a variant of concern. And so, you know, I go back to what should we do in the interim? <laughs> Lily's five point plan. Let's resurrect Lily's five-point plan. It worked, it was relevant then, and it's relevant now. Airlines should provide proof of vaccination. You shouldn't be able to travel on airlines anymore unless you show proof of vaccination. I think we're done with this, you know. We, we really need to do that. Schools should require vaccination for students, teachers, and staff. I mean, it just, you know, it should be. Restaurants and bars should require evidence of uh, proof of vaccination or you'd sit outdoors. Uh, and essential service or services should require masks for all people who walk in at the grocery stores or pharmacies. You know, it works. It worked in Japan has got almost no disease anymore because they instituted a mask mandate. And then finally, it's time to just say booster shots for all adults. I mean, it's the right way to go. And I think if we did that, we would be really in good shape. Unfortunately, if you look at how are we doing with booster shots, Israel, Chile, Uruguay, the U UK, they're all ahead of us. We're, we're really falling behind. We're not leading in vaccination and we're not leading in boosters. So uh, I think the main thing is this week, let's not all panic. Let's be reasonable. Continue to practice, you know, mask wearing when you don't know vaccine status for people. Get your vaccine, be boosted and do the best you can. That's all we can do now and we will see and I will be giving you the information to see whether or not uh, this particular virus uh, variant of concern outcompetes um, Delta. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, happy Hanukkah to everybody. Uh, you know, it's one of those uh, holidays that 
we Jewish people had to invent. Uh, yeah, also, I want to congratulate the uh, School of Health Professions on their graduation that, that takes place this weekend. We have 37 PA students, physician assistant students, and 17 doctor of nurse practicing students, and 24 orthotics and prosthetic students graduating. So congratulations to them. Also want to recognize World AIDS Day this past week. Part of the reason we're talking about it is AIDS hasn't gone away, and uh, it may be impacting what's going on in South Africa. And finally, I want to thank the Dreham family, Drehimes, I hope I pronounced it right, who sent Lily a Christmas ornament. It says Lily went to space. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. So have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>